Damp Spring Advisors founder Andy Constant joins us now. Andy, great to have you with us. Does this mean that uh, we're going to see these rates go even higher, perhaps? Right. So I think, Melissa, that's the question, which is I, equities will only respond. We will only get a tightening of financial conditions if rates do, in fact, go higher. You know, Steve just mentioned the framework around the Fed and its uh, claim that conditions are uh, tight in theory, are restrictive in theory. I think he's right. It's just not in practice. Um, and that could be because the economy can handle higher rates, um, which would mean that if it were not restrictive now, that inflation will stay higher for longer. And so I think until we actually see some evidence of a restrictive economy, which would be widening credit spreads, falling equity prices, uh, widening risk premiums on assets, including term premiums on bonds, higher mortgage rates, the economy is going to still run very hot. And you can tell that um, not by looking at the very shortest uh, expectation of Fed cuts, but you look out to two years now. And over two years, only 107 basis points of total cuts are priced in. So they're not going to cut much for over for almost two years. And so that just tells you that the economy is strong and it'll take more for higher rates and mostly higher long term rates for the economy to turn over. Sounds like, though, then the Fed would have to reevaluate what it believes is restrictive and, and sort of re, you know, configure that framework that Steve was talking about. Do you think that the Fed is getting it wrong right now? Well, I think they uh, do consider financial conditions, broad financial conditions in their framework. They focus and there's a, a my, my op myopic um, behavior that particularly we saw in Waller's speech in December around this very short-term real Fed funds rate that Steve described. But they also have mentioned that when rates were at 5% uh, in October, that higher rates was, was doing some of the Fed's work for them, and they would not have to, have to cut because long-term rates were higher. Since then, they fell 110 basis points to the lows at the end of the year and are finally starting to climb back up. But at this point, they're not anywhere near as restrictive as they were in October. So <clears throat> I think they consider financial conditions, but they do have this myopic approach toward real Fed funds rate that seems to have backfired a bit. Hey, Andy, it's Tim. So let's drill into this 10-year auction, and we spend time with you, and we should all be spending a lot of time focused on uh, this refunding cycle and the ones coming. But to oversimplify your answer, uh, what's causing higher yields? Is it the macro? Uh, is it that the buyers who you know typically have been more aggressive, and there's certainly been a secular trend that's been going on not just this year but for a couple of years, or is it purely the size of these auctions? What is the biggest ingredient to this move higher in rates? So I think three things, but certainly the rates started moving higher um, when the last QRA came out, which was on February 1st. You started to see a significant increase in, in long-term interest rates. And that was because the market um, was not prepared for $538 billion of new coupon issuance in Q2, nor were they prepared for the fact that it's likely to be $1.5 trillion of total supply of new coupon issuance between uh, the beginning of Q2, which we're in, through year end. So there's $1.5 trillion that has to get absorbed. That's certainly impacting uh, bond yields right now. The other thing is that you're seeing rising inflation expectations, which are partly mechanical with increasing in um, oil prices, but also in other commodity prices, but also somewhat in expectations that the Fed has um, um, paused a bit too long in dealing with inflation has let it get away from them a little bit. And you can see that in things like gold. Andy, Karen, thanks for being on. How does the sort of discussion around uh, reducing QT, slowing QT, how does that sort of fit into what Tim brought up on the other side? 
Right. So if they taper QT, which I fully expect them to do in the minutes today, they mentioned it. It may not be in the May meeting, but it's certainly likely to be in the June meeting. They do have some concerns about the uh, uneven uh, distribution of reserves amongst the banking system, which is a small part to be concerned about. Um, so I do expect them to taper. But once again, taper just means that they require less issuance from the U.S. Treasury to pay them back, because, you know, as you know, they we do runoff at the Fed in that they just let bonds mature. In this case, they'll reinvest some more of the proceeds from that re that maturing. And they've handed the monetary ball to the Treasury. So to the extent they taper, that reduces the amount of issuance the Treasury has to use. If they, if the Treasury then decides to keep coupons still at this 500 billion net per quarter and just reduce bills, the taper won't be felt by the economy and it won't be felt by the markets. If they choose to reduce coupons and reduce the amount of supply of duration that the invest the investment community has to buy. Uh, then that would have an impact on taper. So I think by May 1st, when they do the next quarterly refunding announcement, we'll have an answer on how they're going. We may have an answer on how they mm -hmm. plan on changing composition.